Welcome to Rogue Trader. Please read the disclaimer and remember that prices can go down as well as up. Hello and finally it's great to take a look at Greencoat UK Wind PLC. So Greencoat UK Wind PLC are a listed renewable energy fund. They invest only in UK wind farms and you can see here the locations they have all over the UK. They focus on preserving their asset value and returning big dividends to shareholders they're currently paying around 5.5% dividends and they would actually buy back shares if they started trading at a discount to NAV. And they're currently trading at about 1.05 to NAV. So that's fairly good actually. There were times I think before where they were more like 1.20 to NAV. And so this is perhaps a good time to buy them in terms of NAV, although you don't expect that their value of the share price as such will raise much at all from here. They, they currently own 1.2 gigawatts of wind farm assets, which is 5% of the UK total. And it has to be mentioned that they're highly geared. Their main strategy is to sell shares to bring in money through capital raisers. And then also they plan to be about 40% in debt in terms of their total debt to gross asset value. And this way they go around buying up wind farms and then plan to return high dividends to the shareholders from the electricity produced from those wind farms whilst at the same time keeping the share price to NAV ratio of the company sensible. So Greencoat are clearly a Greta Gold pick in terms of they are a very clear cut way to invest into wind energy. Unfortunately, when I looked at their annual report and started working out how the money moves around, I realized that the structure of this company is extremely complex. And so this introduces a kind of risk factor for me of not knowing what I'm investing in. So to go in more detail for that, the actual company that you're buying shares in are Greencoat UK Wind PLC. Now, under, underneath these are a holding company, UK Wind Holco Limited, Limited. And what they do is whenever they buy new wind farms, those are rolled up into these what are called special purpose vehicles, which are legal entities, which are all belong under the umbrella of this Holdco. And then these SPVs then actually sell the electricity produced by the wind farms. And then the main company gets that money from the selling the electricity as dividends that are paid because they own these subsidiaries, they can get the money back as dividends. Now the actual running costs for all these wind farm activity is done by a third party, which is unreal, you know, which is a set completely separate company to Greencoat and they're called Greencoat Capital LLP, and they're known as the investment manager. So, so in 2020, the SPVs paid Greencoat 124 million as dividends. And in order to pay for the running of all these wind farms, Greencoat paid a investment management fee to this third party to then sort all that, all that out. There's also this curious other third party known as the administrator, which I saw referenced and I didn't quite understand what that was, but they're fairly insignificant because they only paid 1.1 million, which is kind of a small amount of the total amount of money going about. So yeah, overall, when I got my head around the uh, structure of this company, there is a bit of a risk element to me of do I really understand this? And that's a shame because the original main message for me was this was really a real simple way to invest in the UK wind. When you go into the annual report, you can see a breakdown of all of their wind farms and you can see how much energy they're producing. And when I compare it to some of the projects I've been looking at, particularly with SSE, um, you know, like the Viking project and the Dogger Bank project. These are actually uh, quite small amounts we see here. Um, actually, 70% of their wind farms are onshore and 30% offshore. 
I'm kind of happier with offshore myself, but um, this is their composition. And in terms of asset age, it's a bit of a mix, but the majority is younger. Now, green coats say that they, they have, um, they think that their wind farms should last typically 30 years. So when you look at their stock price and history, actually most of their news releases are either them raising capital and of course with renewables being so fashionable they've been able to raise a lot of money over the years and often at uh, premium to nav so they actually are doing quite well there then the other news items tends to be them buying wind farms so we see this constant news feed of them buying wind farms uh, the share price was increased um, to quite a high level of uh, 150 um, at, at the end of 2019. And then the general trend since the beginning of 2020 has been downward. And I believe that this is mainly because they had less money coming in. It was actually less windy in 2020. And also, um, and also the price of electricity went down because of the COVID crisis. So perhaps this explains this clear downward trend from the beginning of 2020. Of course, I can't help but mention the COVID crash here. And obviously, wouldn't it have been great to have had these in your watch list back then? Because one obvious buyer that would have been. So I like to do my back of a fag packet calculation sometimes to try and eke out what is the real worth of uh, these companies' investments. Um, and what I did is um, I looked at four of their wind projects and the cost of them. And if you go in the annual report, you can see how much money in dividends they received from each of the projects. So from this, I calculated also, yeah, also from the annual report, you know, what's the percentage of their total output from each project? And from that, how much of the total running costs are being spent on each of those projects? So from this and from knowing the asset life, I worked out the yearly profits and the money that that, uh, the profits that, that each of those assets are going to be bringing in over the course of their lifetime. So from this, this gave me a profit overall the lifetime of each of these. The first column, if I go to their expense statements, the majority of their costs are operating expenses. So the first column just accounts for those operating expenses. And then the other thing, though, is finance expense. So this is at the actual cost of all this massive debt they're in, in terms of interest and stuff. Um, so I then accounted that to come with this second column. Now, of course, this is totally amateur, my stab of it. But really, um, yeah, the numbers don't really please overall. Um, and what I'd say is, should I invest in this company before doing so? I think I'd go through all of their projects and then I'd perform in a bit more detail this, um, this exercise for all their projects just to try and work out for myself, have they really got a good deal for these projects um, or the, the value of this company's assets are audited but there's always a level of uncertainty in that. And, you know, I do wonder, I mean, they're buying off uh, a lot of the companies that they're buying these projects off are huge companies like Scottish and Southern Electricity. And, um, you know, are they actually getting a good deal? So looking at the profit and loss, and you see that most of their income is return on investments. But this is actually fairly patchy or fairly lumpy. So you can get a breakdown of that. And from that, we see that most of it is dividends received. So this is obviously where the SPVs pay the main company, the dividends for the, for the electricity sold. However, the other big thing is the unrealized movement in fair value. 
And so this is where every year they reassess what their assets are worth. And this, there's some big movement something here. And so this causes this lumpiness in terms of the um, income stream that's coming in each year. It's worth going into more detail about these unrealized movement in fair value investments because this was a large proportion of the differences in income each year. And we see that that's further broken down from when I look at the detail in the annual reports into what's called the increase decrease in DCF valuation of investments. Now, when I look into that, we see that what happens is, is there's this process of valuating the assets. And this gives some really useful clues into what it is that could affect the asset value of this company, of this fund effectively, of this investment fund, and then some key risks to look for. And these are mainly the energy, energy yield. So will these, um, you know, will these windmills com continue to produce the same electricity? And is there any errors in, in those predictions? The power price, so we're, you know, we know that the, um, the price actually went down in 2020 and look what happened to the overall value of the equity. But, um, you know, longer term, will power prices go up or down? And I actually think they'll go up because of um, the um, green energy push. But uh, will they? You know, and, and this will be, have an effect in the valuation. Also, inflation is interesting. Um, if we we obviously have record low inflation, but if we if we actually um, came into a, a inflation problem then you could see interest rates raised. And when you consider this company is looking to be 40% indebted in terms of their gearing, that could really cripple this company if uh, we had a high inflation problem. And then asset life. Now they rated the asset life at 30 years, but what if that was wrong in some circumstances? Uh, you know, that again, could seriously affect the numbers. So I think I went into a lot of detail about their income there, which is their return in investments, basically the dividends and any changes in the valuation of their assets. And that's been generally increasing, particularly the, gen the dividends. On the expenditure side, it's just mainly the operating expenses. And these are the expenses that get paid to this third party known as the investment manager who independently uh, arm's length kind of manages the, um, the individual funds. OK, and the other big thing is a finance expense, which is, I believe, costs that they incur when they do their capital raises and then also the interest they have to pay on the debt and paying off debt as well. The tax is minor, but it's interesting because um, they actually gain an income from tax. So this may explain this crazy spaghetti junction structure. Um, it's all a tax thing. And um, they actually end up gaining um, over, you know, gaining a million just from their tax situation. And that's because you get loads of tax credits with these um, renewable energy stuff. And you can see when you when you look in more detail about their taxation, um, they should have paid 38 million in tax. But then through all these kind of clever tricks and, um, and special, um, they then end up um, get gaining money on the tax. So that's the clever. So the most important thing really is the operating profit and then net income. I think the trend, particularly dividends, it dipped since 2020, but that was a COVID and we expect it to bounce back in terms of the price of electricity. The, you know, the net income is all fairly lumpy because of these re-evaluations. Yeah, we see that visually here as well. And then you can see the return on investments, um, which is their main income. It's mostly the dividends. You see the dividend trend here with this unfortunate 
flip-flopping of their valuations every year. And then um, in terms of costs, that's mainly just the management fees. But you can see how interest on debt is starting to become significant. So their assets and their debt, so as we know, they're, they're raising capital through share issuances. They're raising debt and they want to be 40% indebted. And then that's their model. They use all that money to buy assets. And you can see here how actually, you know, their assets really is climbing away from their total debt. And this is quite a nice, clean kind of profile. I guess if, if this started to turn down the net assets, then you'd be starting to worry. It's kind of what you expect for what they are. And no, I don't like the debt, but, uh, you know, it's a 1.1 billion, but it all seems fairly reasonable for what they are. And their statement of cash flows. And in 2020, they raised 145 million from their normal activities. And they also issued 394 million from selling shares and 499 million from taking on new debt. They, they that raised about a billion and they, they spent about a billion, you know, 980 million on buying new wind farms. And they paid out 113 million on dividends. So you've got about a, a billion of positive flow, billion roughly of negative flow. If you consider their activities without the issuing shares, taking on debt and buying new wind farms, then you see that they would have got about 145 million from normal activities, which would well cover their dividend payments. So, you know, their statement of cash flows looks fairly reasonable for what they are. Now, their equity structure is mainly share premium account, you know, mainly where they've just raised shares and sold them, has increased the total equity in the company. Their retained earnings seems to have, um, it demonstrates that they've not really been investing back into their business. You know, they're spending as much as they're um, getting from 2018. And so that's why the retained earnings seems fairly flat from 2018. Um, I do this uh, treatment um, myself and uh, we see the market cap here and how the net assets are very close to the market cap 1.1 and how that's a familiar trend. And this is their um, this is their whole model, um, you know, selling shares, taking on debt and buying assets. And you can see how actually they were expensive to buy in uh, 2019. And you'd actually, to really know you're getting a bargain, you'd wait for the, um, the market cap to drop back so that they were an evens, uh, you know, one-to-one -one price to book ratio, which seems like it could happen uh, potentially with the current trend. Uh, you might want to go snipe into these um, a really good value but generally you know it's a good value you know the valuations are look very reasonable and you can see obviously how debt is a big part of their game to be, so be wary of that so in terms of sector velocity and there's just nothing really to compare them with access to hsbc from that i plotted this um the sector that hsbc put them in is the equity investment instrument sector. So it, this way we've got a comparison with other investment funds, if you like, but which are packaged as equities. But just bear in mind that that includes absolutely everything. Um, however, there is an interesting, it was interesting to see how um, in 2020, Whilst everything else was just going crazy, Greencoat UK was dipping down. And I think we can attribute that to the, the drop in electricity price in 2020 because of COVID, you know, which actually theoretically should go up again. Um, another thing that's just interesting I've noticed that's not really related to Greencoat is notice how these riskier things have all kind of lost their nerve this year in 2021. 
you know, after screaming up, whereas the stock market seemed to have been um, steady, you can see how these riskier funds and stuff seem to be having a bit of a um, a bit of vertigo, just something just noticeable on that scale that I thought I'd mention. Yeah, so when I first looked at Green Coat UK Wind, I thought an excellent, simple way to invest in, to invest in wind power. When I then looked into the detail, looked under the surface, there's a lot of complexity there, which introduces a I don't understand what I'm investing in factor. Plus, we've also got to consider that, you know, their, their assets are subject to valuations which can change. I think that there's some negative things of wind power, like, you know, in the long run, are there going to be problems with the, um, you know, how long they can maintain producing energy for efficiently before you have to replace the engines or, or replace the uh, sails, the turbines themselves on, the, uh, on each unit. But overall, I, I think they're a... I think that they're overall a good, clear way to invest in Greta Gold, but I'm a little put off with um, the, this complexity and then not being totally sure about the valuations. So I'm kind of lukewarm about them because I want to go for some Greta Gold and I can't find anything. These make sense, but I'm only lukewarm about them. Um, I forgot to mention earlier, but um, I looked at the UK wind speeds over time on the Statista website, and that's actually fairly safe, I should say. But it's more the, you know, what is the real asset life? Um, what's the um, energy yield going to be that I'm kind of more concerned about? So overall, I'm lukewarm about green coats. I've added them to my watch list. By the way, I'm going to have to delete Gamesys from my watch list because their company is being taken over. But yes, um, I'm going to add them to my watch list, but I'm going to just wait for their price, this price trend to finish, this downward trend to finish. And in the future, research into them more intensely before investing in them if I can't find anything better. I've added Scottish and Southern Electricity to my watch list too because researching into green coat made me appreciate their wind energy stuff more, particularly their Dogger Bank and their Shetland Viking projects. Um, but again, they're kind of very, very, they're not even lukewarm. I'm cold on them, but but, you know, I want to add them and maybe take another look at them in the future once I've uh, done a bit more shopping first. Anyone who uh, did like them enough for my video to invest in them, though, the key risks I identified are there's a bit of what am I investing in risk because of the way they're structured. If interest rates were to increase, that could be really nasty for them. Their asset yields and life are a risk factor. The cost of their debt is something you'd have to keep an eye on once you bought them. And electricity prices and electricity demand. Now, we, as, as believers in Greta Gold, think that demand in electricity and prices are both going to go up. So actually, that's positive for them. But it's still um, a risk that you've got to uh, consider. So I really hope you found this useful and good luck with your investing.